It's an honor to be back with you one more time in this building and uh, as you prepare to move into your new building in a few months. As a native Dentonite, it's a joy to see just how much this church has grown in recent years. And I bring you greetings from uh, Neshota House Theological Seminary up in Wisconsin from our Dean Garwood Anderson and from uh, our new Dean just announced this week, Lauren Whitna, um, and from uh, a, uh, a curate who I believe will be coming to you soon, uh, Father Yehoshua Odidi. Uh, there's, there's lots of uh, affection that we have for you in, uh, in Wisconsin, and of course, lots of affection that I as a, as a Dentonite have for you. One of my uh, great delights, really, is in visiting you, as, as I get to on occasion, is I get to be surprised by seeing people I've known from different contexts in Denton uh, gathering here now to worship. There are lives in this church being changed and uh, families being raised up in the faith. God is producing fruit here, and God is worthy of all glory for it. Today, I want to look into the words of Jesus, the true vine and the words from the first epistle of John and ask some specific questions. One, how do we bear fruit? Two, how do we become fruitless? And three, how can we cultivate fruitfulness in our life and in the church? So let's look at how we bear fruit. I've noted evidence of fruitfulness and some numerical growth here that points to fruitfulness in other areas, such as discipleship and changed lives here. There's always a temptation when you look at growth in a church to assign a sort of formula to fruitfulness that you could uh, do it elsewhere or do it in any circumstance. It's the clergy, it's the volunteers, young people, it's babies, it's a booming economy. But if we listen to what Jesus says in our gospel reading, we have to doubt these sort of simple explanations. Clergy, volunteers, cultural economic forces, all of these factors can certainly aid growth. But they do not produce what Jesus would call fruit. Jesus says, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He goes on, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. St. Paul says to the Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but God causes the growth. God does it. We bear fruit when God is at work in and through us. This is really important to remember because despite how much we may believe that God causes the growth and we may give God thanks for blessings and give him the credit for blessings, the fruit we see on the vine, we also have a tendency to look past fruit very quickly and ask questions like, what is the secret to this success that we could ensure that it happens from generation to generation? As if fruit was simply a result of the best methods, smartest leaders, largest budgets. Budgets, programs, and leaders are important. We rightly spend time and effort developing these resources. But make no mistake, growth is not the same thing as fruit. We could all list churches who are large in number and lacking real fruit. And many of us have known times in our spiritual lives where fruit that once seemed to spring up almost without our trying now seems to have dried up, and we don't know how to bring it back. Which leads us to ask why we may become fruitless. This is no light question. Jesus makes it clear that much more is at stake than a cluster of grapes versus a bundle of leaves. He says, my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. You might be more comfortable with this image than I am, but to hear it makes me wince. Is this a threat from Jesus? You better bear fruit. God's going to cut you off and burn you. Maybe you've heard a sermon like this before. I'm not saying there isn't a time and a place for talking about Jesus, the righteous judge, to whom we all must give an account, who we confess will come with glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. True. 
true. But to take Jesus' judgment as some sort of threat meant to motivate us into fruitfulness misses the point of the teaching entirely. And I believe it's inconsistent with the point Jesus is trying to make here. Perfect love casts out fear, our epistle reading said. First off, Jesus' point here is that he is the true vine. The father is the vine grower. To hear this in Jesus' day would evoke several images. One, of course, being agricultural. This is just how people live in the Mediterranean. But throughout the Old Testament law and prophets, God's people, Israel, are referred to as God's vineyard, God's vine. They are transplanted from Egypt. This is agricultural language and planted in the promised land. God is calling them to fruitfulness and pruning them. Like a master vine grower, God sends judges, kings, prophets to prune the chosen people, calling them to follow God, at times calling them to return to God. Jesus picks up this image in the parable of the vineyard, not our parable from today, but the one where the people are hired for the same wage despite the number of hours they worked. You get the same payment at the 11th hour as those who bore the heat of the day. In the parable of the wicked tenants, another parable, Jesus talks about those who tend God's vineyard, but neglect the vine, despise the landowner, and kill his messengers and his son. These are images that Jesus is using to gather in these Old Testament images of Israel as God's vine. But in our reading today, Jesus turns this imagery on its head entirely. God's people in this passage are not the vine. Jesus himself is the true vine. We don't produce the fruit. God bears the fruit in us if, and only if, we abide in him. Jesus is saying that life, true life, a fruitful life, a life lived in the kingdom Jesus reveals, isn't a life we can get without him. We're God's creation, yes, and we are very good, but we are not the source of any life. Even in the garden, before the fall, when that very good that God spoke over us was unspoiled, we did not have life springing up from ourselves. God commands, make babies, plant trees, grow a garden. And we can say, we continue in those acts today, and good stuff happens. Life happens. But we are not the source of that life. Next to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there was also a tree of life. And it wasn't our tree. Since we ate the fruit, the garden enclosing the tree of life has been cut off to us. Ever since that day, we have all been longing again for the tree of life. Who wouldn't want live without fear, without death, without the experience of decay we feel in our aching joints, in our broken relationship, in, in our hearts? Here's what Jesus is saying. He is the tree of life, the true vine. In our epistle reading, John puts it this way. God sent his only son into the world that we might have life through him. That we might have life through him. John makes it clear. This is done through the cross, the tree of life. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. John's gospel says it this way. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. Jesus says elsewhere in the gospel, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is what John's gospel is all about. A question not about fruit, but about life. So when we're lacking in fruit, we have to ask, are we connected to the true vine? Churches must continually return to this question, corporately and individually. If life is found in Christ alone, if apart from me, you can do nothing, are we with him? Are we withering and drying up? Or are we full of life, renewed? I sense this in myself when things may be going just fine, but I feel empty, devoid of life. I can go through the motions and perform with the best of them, and good things may happen, but not in me. I feel dead. I feel 
cut off from real life, even while trying to pour out life and blessing to others. We know this when our con connection to the vine gets strained or cut. I don't know about you, but in those times when it feels like I'm being pruned, I don't like it. Not a bit. Pruning hurts. Cutting away of things that drain energy but produce no fruit is not easy. The irony is that I get so hungry for life, for significance, so anxious of my own limitations that I don't want to wait for God to bring the fruit. I want to bootstrap it on my own like a good Texan. The problem is that this leaves me cut off from my only source of life and fruit. So as I close, how do we stay connected to the vine? How do we cultivate fruitfulness in our life together? Jesus sums it up in one word, abide. Abide in me as I abide in you. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. What does it mean, though? What does it mean to abide? How do we do it? It's kind of a funny thing because the word abide really just means remain or dwell. It's what we do in our homes. It's not cooking and eating, cleaning or watching TV. It's not going to sleep there at night. Guests can do that, and they don't abide. You can go do that at somebody else's house on Airbnb for months at a time if you like, and you don't abide there. Abiding is just the act of being at home in your home. But how do we do that with Jesus? The analogy still isn't totally clear. Simply put, it's living your life in Jesus. Waking, sleeping, working, weeping, giving your life to and drawing life from Jesus. We come home to him in our baptism and in the life of faith that follows, in hearing and receiving his word as our life. Jesus says elsewhere in the gospel, or uh, in our gospel reading, you have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Our life from there is lived cultivating that relationship, cultivating that connection. It happens primarily in worship. Coming to, week, uh, coming to Mass weekly is a really great place to start. The daily office of morning, noonday, evening prayer and Compline in the Book of Common Prayer is an excellent place to continue that growth day by day. Or just try reading your Bible and praying a little. Throughout the generations, women and men of faith have recognized that God does something in our worship, in the Eucharist, that changes us, that gives us life. The earliest example of Christian worship we have outside the New Testament, a prayer book of sorts called the Didache, it comes from the late first century, early second century, describes the Eucharist in terms of this life. Listen to what these earliest Christians prayed together when they gathered. We give you thanks, our Father, for the holy vine of David, your servant. Language from our passage today. The holy vine of David, your servant, which you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant. To you be the glory forever. It continues with words that are reflected in one of the communion hymns in the hymnal. Uh, it begins with, God, we thank thee who is planted. It says, as this grain was scattered upon the mountains and then gathered together and became one, so may your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. The image is this, like the grain that is harvested, crushed, mixed, baked into bread that we break in the Eucharist, like the cluster of grapes that are gathered and crushed together and mature into the wine we offer, we in the Eucharist are gathered together and made one, one with each other and one with Jesus, the vine of David, who gives us life. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 6, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me. There's that word again. They abide in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. We pray this in the prayer of humble access, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Same word, dwell, abide, through the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit, in the bread we break and the, the wine we drink, God gives us his son, Jesus, 
He pours his life into us. We taste the body and the blood of the ultimate fruit of the vine, the death and resurrection of God's Son, our Lord, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Abiding begins with worship, the corporate participation in the life-giving fruit of the gospel, in the bread and the wine, the giving of the peace, confession, absolution, hearing and preaching of Jesus' words, that his words would abide in us and we would abide in him. Here, we learn the degree of God's love for us, given in forgiveness, in unity with Christ, even when we are unworthy. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is where we learn how to love. And from here, we go to see our friends, our coworkers, our families, stretching forth our hands in that love. From here, we go in peace to love and serve the Lord. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.